I've called this talk challenging myself, um, trying to work out how it is that I've got where I've got. Um, and I think I sort of set myself a series of tasks and a series of challenges to try and uh, not live com too comfortably. But um, my beginnings, uh, as it said, my mum's from Iran, my dad's from Sudan. I had a very uh, incredible childhood in Sudan. Uh, these are my sister's uh, notebooks. I have similar ones, but I couldn't find them. But I mean, we, we were beaten. As you can see there, she says, um, I was on the phone and mommy came home and beat me. And then, and then the girl says, bad girl. The, the teacher says, bad girl. Um, it, it, was a type, it was a very strict upbringing. The, the standard um, punishment would have been to write the times tables up to 12 out in full. Uh, and I remember the military coup in Sudan as well. So it was, it, was a, it was one of these interesting childhoods in Africa where you get to see a lot of things and subconsciously they're going in. So I've always had that sort of perspective. But at school here in England, I was definitely a late developer. Um, I chatted a lot. Um, a lot of my reports there, particularly this one. I mean, look at that score, 32%. I never did well at school. Javid has worked well, well this term, but I'd like him to curb his tendency to chat or cheerfully immature, chatty, inclined to be superficial. I was only eight. I don't know what these, what, these, what, these, what these headmasters and people wanted from me. But anyway, I didn't do too well at school. So you, you think, how the hell did he become a doctor then? And I think I really wanted to be a pilot my whole life. And I sort of fell into medicine. And it seemed like the path of least resistance when the time came. Um, because veterinary medicine would have been what I should have done, I think. But um, they needed higher grades, so I chose medicine instead. <laughs> and um, my, my mantra at medical school was be average, because excelling is wasted energy. Because at medical school, you, you don't get first, seconds, whatever. Either you're the gold medalist, one student in all of University of London, or you pass. So for me, it was, you know, just beat 10% of the year and you'll get through. So that's how I, I, I spent my life as a doctor, as, as, as a medical student, which probably you'd think wouldn't have set you up, set me up well. Um, but I knew I was always going to do MSF. And um, when I first applied to them, they rejected me. So that was the first sort of real failure in my life. And it was a horrible shock. And I had to go away for another two or three years, do some more training, do some more courses before I could reapply again. But at least it, it taught me not to give up at the first hurdle. And it's with MSF that, um, oops, is this going? Here we go. That I discovered my strengths, which I discovered, I think, very late. I was already 30 at that time. And in the preparation course, um, I kept being put forward as a leader for the group. And I kept resisting that. And, and I got taken aside and, and the, um, the coach was trying to, discover in me why I resisted that. But uh, nonetheless, I took it on eventually. And I have to admit that my, my life with MSF definitely gives me a lot of perspective and gratefulness and gives me a chance to exercise my caring in a way that, um, uh, that is fulfilling hugely. Um, I'm going to next go into two instances where I think I was really challenged and where I uh, didn't necessarily do too well and then had um, grave consequences on my psychology thereafter, but it's a, it's a, it's a growing, uh, I'm a work in progress. My second mission, after six months in Iraq, I went to Haiti for six months, and Haiti, after the earthquake, uh, was a difficult place to be. This is meant to be a river. There's so much plastic waste on that, you can walk across it. It's it, it, parts of the, the city there, parts of the capital, Port-au-Prince, uh, Cité Soleil, is a slum like this, which is where I was working. Um, there was a lot of destruction. Uh, people were still living in uh, tin, tin huts or in camps. This was already five months after the earthquake. And I'd, I'd describe my first five months in Haiti as a low-grade war of attrition on my psychology. Uh, there were, I'd never seen so much death that was easily avoidable. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of rape. There was um, a lot of communicable diseases, malaria, tuberculosis. Uh, we couldn't even treat TB in our clinic, so we would have pay people in to palliate them, this, you know, sh stuff that shouldn't really be happening. Um, a lot of children dying. Um, and I'd give one example of one case which sort of ep epitomized everything is, you know, one day I was in the, uh, I was doing emergency services, internal medicine, uh, ITU, and also um, taking care of the elective surgery circuit in outpatients. So it was a small hospital in the slum, which is called Cité Soleil. And at the time of the earthquake, the prison was uh, demolished, so to speak, and a, a lot of the prisoners 
uh, fled into the city and uh, gang warfare was re-established because they wanted to try and maintain their lines of um, borders, so to speak. So there was a lot of violence and rape being used as a tool of violence. And because it's a Catholic country, there's no um, official uh, abortion, but we would, we would provide that for rape victims on the quiet inside our facility. But often, uh, uh, once one young lady came in and she, she brought in her baby, and um, I was shocked to see that it was, it, it was a newborn. By, by the records, it had been born just 19 days previously in our own hospital where we did maternity services. And it was emaciated. She hadn't fed it. She hadn't fed it for those 19 days. And it turned up this little shriveled mass. Um, and and she, she, she came to the A&E at the last minute, sort of, I presume, to absolve her own guilt. Um, but you have to imagine what makes a young mother... Um, starve their child and in what context she had given birth to that child and, and fallen pregnant. And so it was that type of situation. The baby died. There was no way it was going to survive. But uh, we were seeing cases like that constantly, every day. You know, I had a 14-year-old dying. I had, I had one day, seven days in a row of children just just dying right in front of me. And it just, it was just constant difficulty, Haiti. It was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever did but um, six years ago tomorrow, so November the 4th, we had Hurricane, Hurricane Thomas came along. And there was obviously a, recently a hurricane in Haiti, and it's hurricane season. Um, and what we did is that, oops, sorry. What we did was uh, we had to evacuate our medical tent. There's Mireille, one of my doctors. Uh, we were evacuating the medical tent, moving all the patients upstairs because we expected our ground floor of the hospital to get flooded and uh, we were still were using tents. We didn't have enough buildings in, in the hospital. And we put on a, an on-call rotor with a nurse, a logistician, the team leader and myself. And while we were packing up that medical tent, the medical unit, I was, I was given a letter, a thank you letter from a patient, which I very quickly read, put in my pocket and, 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 and carried on with my evening work. Um, the hurricane didn't quite hit as, um, as solidly as it was expected to, but uh, the next morning, with all the rain, uh, cholera finally arrived in the slum. And cholera had never happened before in Haiti for, for a good hundred years. And the last two cases I saw that morning, what firstly was a trauma case, a, a man that had been attacked by vigilantes, had been accused of... Um, uh, stealing a purse from a lady, and they, they went at him with, with a hacksaw. And you can imagine a, a human being who's trying to protect their body like this, and people are attacking with a sword. So you can imagine what type of injuries this man had, apart from the stab wounds, fingers, arms, you know, down to... We tried, we tried, but it was, it, it was very, very bloody. And I remember, all I just remember was just covered in blood, but luckily I had spare clothes because I'd been there overnight, and he didn't survive, as with everybody else. But... Um, I, I changed into my new clothes, went to the front tent to see some presumed uh, cholera patients, and I got vomited on by this little girl. And I thought, well, this is, this is turning out to be a great 48 hours. But that was just the start of it. Um, the next month, which was my last month of six in Haiti, I mean, if I say the first five months were a war of attrition, this was a full-on assault. You, you cannot imagine. I don't know anyone here who's done cholera treatment no, you can't. You, I don't think you can imagine sort of people being brought in with wheelchairs. Um, this bed here, a cholera bed has a hole and a bucket at the top end. So patients can just, without having to leave the bed, they, they get so debilitated, they just um, uh, open their bowels and vomit where they are. And it's your job to then clear the, clear the chlorine buckets, put up as many fluids as you possibly can, and move them on to the, to, to the actual cholera unit. We were a triage centre, but people were coming in in wheelchairs. Um, as soon as we put beds down, it, people were on it. There were two, you know, two children to a bed. These are 300 litre buckets that you had to make up with all rehydration salts. I remember one morning, you do your day in the hospital and you do a night shift in the cholera tent. And one morning, about three in the morning, it was raining horribly and um, tearing. We'd run out of pre-made solutions, so I got all my uh, stretcher bearers and you know, tearing 300 sachets of ORS and putting it in, in that container, filling it up with water and handing it out to the patients at about three in the morning. And I took a break 
And um, I went to sleep for about two hours and I came back at five o'clock and I'd signaled to the two doctors, two little girls about the age of eight. And um, I'd signaled uh, that they, they should be closely monitored uh, because I thought that they were going to go in the wrong direction and should give them intravenous fluids, not just oral fluids. Uh, and when I came back two hours later, they died. And I carried that with me. I, I've, I, I blamed myself. So it's a little bit of judging or regret that I have. And I still carry the fact that those two died. And when you're plugging the orifices of an eight-year-old with chlorine-soaked cotton before you give it back to their mother who's looking at you saying, I'm, you know, I'm glad you tried, but you're telling yourself, yeah, but I should have done better. That's, it's very, very, very hard to deal with. And by the time, and people were not treated with any dignity. This is a cattle truck. There was, there, there was, we were using whatever we could to get patients moved. It was, it was a horrid scenario for which I was not prepared. So by the time I got on my last day leaving Haiti in December 2010, I just, I felt like this, this photo was supposed to be recreating how I'd felt for six months in Haiti, which is that I'd been smashed and, and run over by a car and the car was, was MSF. It was a very hard time. Uh, and I then went into a sort of two and a half years of being at sea. I'd, I'd vowed to leave medicine altogether, um, applied to the foreign office, successfully got into the diplomatic service. Uh, that didn't go well. Went to work on a cruise ship to save money for a master's. That didn't go well. Uh, came back home uh, one summer just not feeling right. And it was summer 13, so two and a half years after leaving Haiti. And I... And I thought, I know, I'm going to pick up that letter. I, I remembered this letter that this patient had written to me in that tent. Uh, and there's the date, 4th of, 4th of November 2010. I've not shown this to anyone before, this letter. So it's a little bit... Um, any French speakers? <laughs> Can you read it from there? No. Um, I won't even read it in French to you, but I mean, the first line, it's so eloquent. I, I salute you in the name of he who, by his death, gave us life, Jesus Christ. I mean, what, what, an, what an opening sentence to, in a letter from, from a, a random Haitian. Um, by and large, the population we're treating were not uh, educated. And I remembered actually what had happened. He was a cardiac arrest. He was a respiratory arrest. He'd stopped breathing because he had such a bad asthma attack. And I had gone into the, the <coughs> ER, the emergency room, being called in to... Um, to try and help resuscitate him. And I had actually told the team to stop. Um, and then at the last sort of moment, he had a seizure it coupled with some sort of, you know, it was, he had a very weird activity. And we were doing chest compressions and I thought, right, let's give adrenaline, let's do this, let's do that. If he goes again, we won't resuscitate him. And he didn't, but he survived and he survived mentally intact, but I'd, I'd forgotten about him. And, he, and he'd survived to write me this letter. And I read this letter when I was at home in Cambridge. And, um, it really moved me. I broke down. I broke down so thoroughly. You can imagine that sort of sobbing, saliva, mucus. I mean, utter, utter breakdown when I read the rest of it. I mean, he says, um, so there's a, there's a quote from Proverbs. He who, he who despises his neighbour commits a sin, but uh, blessed is he who pities the poor. I think it's something like that from the Bible. Um, uh, God is the source of all life, but it's for... It's for man to ensure that it's conserved so and he's, he's very obviously religious and he wrote um uh, god raised your spirit and you didn't abandon me and so therefore you are blessed as the as the proverb says and then this was the sentence that just just got me i say you I, I tell you thank you the biggest word in the human dictionary <clears throat> And I read this letter, and, I, and honestly, it was, it's, it's obviously, if you were going to keep a gratitude chronicle, a gratitude journal, this would go in it. But sadly, I seem to dwell on all the sort of negative points. But this is definitely a, a positive for me. Um, I then couldn't, I didn't work for the next six months. I, I ended up um, trying to re reply. I wrote to him a reply. I, I couldn't send it. It's just at home on my desk. Um, but I needed those six months to try and process everything that had happened in Haiti. And even to this day, as you can hear when I talk about it, I haven't, I haven't really talked about Haiti in any of my talks before because it, it just was, a, it's still a bit raw, to be honest. But after I picked myself up, I went back to work one day a week, two days a week, six months later, I thought, right, I'm going to do MSF again. I set myself another challenge and, I, and, and 
I went, I don't take it easy on myself. I, I went to South Sudan first. I did a quick mission. It was fantastic. Came back and then Ebola reared its ugly head. And I went there and I thought I want to challenge my mental resilience. I wanted to see how much caregiving I could give, but also to show solidarity. I think West Africa very much was closed off from the world and it felt like they were being um, ignored, so to speak. And though I had many successes there, I'm trying to examine why I still had another negative dip after Ebola and I thought I was going to be strong enough, but I wasn't. I think I'd promised myself, I'd promised myself one thing, one thing, Javid, if it's in your power, don't let someone die alone. And um, I, I think I failed with Alpha, who's this little boy here, and you can see that um, he was crying blood from his eyes. And if I really sort of sit back and I say, why did Ebola affect me so badly? It affected me because of him, because I think I could have done better. So there was a challenge that I set myself and I failed at it. And I think that would be one of the regrets that I carry. Um, but I still talk about him because I think it's important uh, that he is remembered somehow. I was still able to give him painkillers at the end, uh, but I couldn't stay at his side because you don't know when someone's going to die. And when you're under all that clothing, uh, it's very hard to stay stay in there for a period of time but I think with that challenge I grew again I think um, I'm finding the meaning in what I want to do I'm finding a balance uh, this summer um, I also went away with MSF again I was on the rescue ship off the coast of Libya with migrants coming into Italy um, but I've learned I mean this is this is how bad the ship was the ship was dreadful look how tired I looked I hated working on a cruise ship if any of you are thinking about going to work on a cruise ship don't but um, I've learned not to take myself too seriously, as you can see here. I mean, these people are tall, but I'm hardly, hardly um, <laughs> keeping up with them. That's a, that's a publicity shoot for an upcoming series. But I thought it's quite amusing that I had to stand on a box. But um, I found happiness with MSF, as you can see there. I don't take myself too seriously. I set myself challenges. They set me back. They affect me, as you can see. But it's a work in progress is how I see it. And that's my meaning in my life is to carry on doing these things. Um, and if I hark back to those reports, I'm still a distracting chatterbox in this team photo that we took on the ship in August. So I guess I haven't changed that much. Uh, and, I, and I wonder if my teachers would be very amused to see what I'm doing now. But anyway, that's it. That's all I'm, that's all I'm here to say. Um, so thank you for listening. <laughs>